Good morning. Um, I'm happy to be chairing the session here, the paper session one. So apparently up to now we haven't been doing serious work. Just play, which is nice. And uh, we had one cancellation, so the first paper will be skipped. And I'm very happy to introduce the second paper, Kate Sikio, Camille Baker, Rebecca Stewart, and Phoebe Brown on the topic of hacking the body 2.0, flutter, stutter. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. So I'm going to, I'm Camille Baker, and I'm at um, University for the Creative Arts. So I'm going to start. We're, we're, we kind of set it up like a panel. So we're going to each talk about our part in this pro uh, project. And what I'm going to do is just introduce the overarching project, um, Hacking the Body 2.0 and where that came from. So Kate Sikio here, second in, <laughs> and I started this uh, project, uh, Hacking the Body, um, a few years ago. And we had both come from different um, practices, Kate Moore from dance, myself um, working with sensors and wearables in performance. So we thought uh, after we'd finished our PhDs, we'd collaborate and put something together that brought both um, both uh, interests together. Our first um, iteration of Hacking the Body, um, was it was just Hacking the Body, now we're Hacking Body 2.0, and we were concerned with um, looking at the ethos of hacking and the methods within performance context um, that we could use the concepts and ethos of hacking. So we, we felt we were hacking, hacking for performance. The conceptual framework behind Hacking the Body was focused on rhetoric and practices of personal code mining and data collection, and how we can access yet question the variety of parameters of body information and the states of being. Our objective was to explore ways in which human physical states could be meaningful, meaningfully exposed in the network and repurposed, thereby hacking. This resulted in DIY electronics and wearable tech e-textile making to create our own sensors. So for the first um, part of that project, we both learned how to make our own sensors and embed them in our own custom um, pieces. And then we started sharing that with others and did a number of workshops with others, particularly performers, to teach them how to make their own e-textile um, custom garments for performance. Um, and we, we focused on ways to train and engage these performers in using emergent technologies and devices as a means to enhance their creative process, but also to devise new forms of immersive experiences for audiences. So, let me go to the next slide. Yeah. So, we worked on that part of the process for some time, and then we started to get um, more interested in the issues around data collection, um, and about two years ago, perhaps, um, when a large number of uh, sports um, applications or sports wearable devices came out, there was a huge um, explosion in wearable technology, particularly in sports, and we were concerned about the fact that um, corporations are collecting our data, selling it on to health and other um, insurance agents, et cetera. So um, we wanted to refocus and think about new directions with our, pra our, our practice. I can't even see that. So I'm going to come around. So some of the issues that we wanted to look at were how to repurpose and recognize um, the origins of, of hacking, looking at low level or DIY, collaborative and open source sharing and post disciplinary issues that many of you are probably working with but particularly in um, dance and movement and participatory performance. That's what our focus was. I think at this point I'm to hand it off to Becky to talk about... Um, oh, sorry, there's a few quotes that we collected. I can't, we had some issues with our, pr our presentation here. We can't quite see it here, so I'm going to just go over some of the things that we felt were really important in, in terms of um, issues around hacking the body and hacking ethos in performance. I'll let, I'll let you read that because I can't see it. We don't have, well, okay. 
<laughs> yeah. So it moved forward. So I'm going to let Becky take over. We had another uh, participant in our process um, for this new version of Flutter Stutter, which we're going to present tonight, um, which is a new iteration from uh, Hacking the Body 2.0. Tara Boeth Mooney was our um, costume designer, and she's not here today. So Becky worked with her, and she's going to talk through their working process together. Hello, so yeah, I'm Becky, and so t I will do my best to give uh, the best representation I can of, of Tara's work and her process. So this was Tara's original sketch of what the actual physical manifestation of what would be worn on the dancer's bodies could be. Uh, so this was uh, last autumn, and the two of us were throwing around ideas of what could be the textile interface that a dancer would be interacting with. So the idea is a dancer is able to trigger uh, through some kind of motion inside the garment, with the garment that they're wearing, be able to trigger a, an actuator in the other dancer's garment at the same, uh, in order to uh, have a, uh, uh, to generate some kind of movement or a response to that, to that uh, kind of invisible message being sent between the bodies. And so we were looking at uh, pleats in particular and pleating of fabrics and what kind of natural affordances can you give to a textile that's being worn on the body. And so Tara's really interested in sustainability within fashion, which might seem like it's something that sits a bit outside of working with electronics and wearables and live performance, but actually is a topic that comes up a lot when you're talking about electronic textiles, actually. it's. Uh, the electronics industry has huge issues of, of waste and, and environmental issues that are not fully addressed, both humanitarian and environmental. And it has strong parallels inside the fashion industry as well, which has its very similar humanitarian and environmental issues as well. And so Tara was really interested in working with materials that were all secondhand and reused. So they were all, uh, I think, from charity shops is where she found them, and redying uh, textiles that were had a previous life in a previous garment. I'm not sure how well the photo turns out. And then in particular, she was very conscious that we were working with technology and that we are moving past the point where making the, the technology itself very explicit and very visible on the body is actually, it's a little bit tired at this point. Yes, we know you can put circuits on the body and we all know what an Arduino looks like. Maybe we don't want to just stare an Arduino strapped to a dancer's body. What could be instead, uh, a costume, a garment that actually is antithetical to what you think of when you think of technology. So she went with very soft colors and very soft fabrics, a lot of ruffles and the pleats and plaits in order to have a very different aesthetic uh, to what you would think is happening inside the dance performance. So that the technology is not the forefront. It's the performance and what you're looking at is what, is what you're being faced with, not thinking about Arduinos. So as we started, okay, so it's the actuator. Sorry, it's a little bit of an awkward setup. Uh, so the pleats are the sensor. So there's a shoulder piece that's being worn by each dancer. And they, the interaction with the fabrics on that shoulder will trigger both an auditory sound, so you'll, it will literally just plays back a sound file, and then on the other dancer will also trigger an actuator. And so part of the, the challenge in the brief that uh, Kate and Camille really wanted was to move away from the kind of standard dictionary of actuators on bodies of vibration motors, uh, which was welcome but also a challenge. It's a lot of work to think of something else, of how do you kind of create movement on the body that uh, is not just putting on a little vibration motor. So I came up with what has colloquially become the tickle motor. So it's a, just a little rotary motor that has a ribbon attached to it and it gets placed in the garment just along the neck as you can see in the photo. And what it does is when it's triggered, when it's turned on, it just it has a quite a, a light tickling sensation uh, to the dancer. 
and I'll leave uh, Phoebe to kind of talk more about uh, kind of that feeling versus the the vibration, but it actually turned out to be quite an important part of the, of the work, uh, that the, the actual tactile uh, feeling of this, of this motor. So the, the nuts and bolts of what the, the system is, for those of you who are interested in this, um, if you don't care about this, then I will move quickly through it. Uh, so we are borrowing from the language of Internet of Things. And so if you have your proverbial fridge and you want to connect it to your proverbial Internet, uh, kind of the emerging standard way of doing that is a messaging protocol called MQTT. And so wanted to take the technology that you would use to connect your thing to the Internet and instead use that to connect dancers' bodies to each other and to the, to the choreographer as well. So the overall view of what's going on is we have two shoulder circuits. They're talking, uh, they're both listening and uh, publishing MQTT packets over Wi-Fi to uh, a broker being run on a laptop uh, using Mosquito and uh, then also a, a GUI uh, being run for the choreographer to observe what's going on and also to give a, a point for her to be able to interact with the dancers as well. So instead of having her own uh, sensor system to trigger the motors on the two dancers. She has her own window into the system so she can, can message as well. To dig slightly deeper into what one of the shoulder circuits looks like, uh, the main microcontroller is an ESP8266, uh, which is a popular, just cheap Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller right now. It's connected to the motor, so it listens for a particular uh, messaging feed. MQTT, you can kind of think of it like social media. It's a little like, you can kind of think of it like Twitter, where you can kind of publish to a hashtag and choose to listen to a hashtag. And so it's listening for anything published for kind of the hashtag, if you will, of the other dancer's uh, shoulder sensors. And then if it, receive, if it observes any messages from that dancer, then it will trigger its motor on, on its uh, wearer. And then uh, the sensor itself is a NPR-121 uh, capacitive touch sensor, which is then connected to a series of conductive threads that are embedded inside of the pleats in the textile. So these are just some photos of the, the iteration of building this. So actually, we had some discussions yesterday at a different event I was at about dancers being extreme users. And I think this is very true. Um, you have a very defined set of movements with a musical instrument. You know, it's, if, there's, if there's great movement involved, it's really quite defined. There's a dictionary of movements for even a new instrument. Dancers, you put something on their body, they seem to be attracted to figuring out how to break it. <laughs> it's, and the biggest challenge of the project has been how to make something last more than a rehearsal or a single performance. We're getting there. So working with a lot of uh, uh, e-textile techniques, uh, largely for the comfort of the dancer. Hard PCBs are not comfortable on the body. And so working with making fabric circuit boards, working with conductive fabrics, conductive uh, uh, threads in combination with off-the-shelf uh, uh, circuit boards as well. So the red board is the capacitive touch sensor and the blue board is the microcontroller with the, the Wi-Fi as well. Uh, and so that's two different generations. And so we'll be at a poster session, at the demo and poster session tomorrow morning. And so if you're interested and want to have a poke at these, um, if they all survive the performance this evening. <laughs> yeah, or you can come see the ways in which they break. Actually, that probably is more interesting. If you want to come see how they break, um, then you're very welcome to come by and see it in person tomorrow. Uh, and then just in, in the costumes. We've played around also other placements on the body, such as the hips. And then that's a close-up of the, the shoulder and the pleats. So the pink pleats, that is the sensor. So that if, as the dancer touches that, uh, it, uh, six or seven different sensors embedded in that, essentially. Okay, so I'll pass you off to Kate. <laughs> um, so I'm Kate, and I'm going to talk more about the um, actual choreographic interventions that the technology um, sort of brings to the piece. So um, for the past um, three or four years now, I've been working with this idea of like how to hack choreography, how to change a choreographic score and performance. And I'm particularly interested in uh, working with um, movement improvisation. So what's happening in most of um, the pieces I make, there's an overall compositional score. 
and then the dancers within that score are creating their movement in that moment. So for this um, particular um, piece, the score actually started to become um, based on the different user, user interactions, um, sort of like that diagram that Becky showed with there's you know, actuator to sensor on the dancers, but then there's this other control um, from, from me at the laptop. So um, we sort of think of the piece happening in three scenes. So the first section is just um, dancer to dancer, nonverbal communication through sensor and actuator and responding. And it really becomes a dialogue between the two of them. Um, so they're really focusing on um, responding to the sensation that the other one's giving them through the actuator. In the second sort of scene of the piece, we actually take away their sensor. They can only... Um, respond to the actuation, and I'm the one who's actually um, controlling all of that actuation from the laptop. In the third scene, it actually it goes back to the sensor to actuator interaction. However, um, in that scene, they're now given the task not to use their hands. So it starts very much with them trying to use their body in new ways with the sensor. And then the second part of that scene is them using the other person's body <laughs> um, to actuate um, the um, sensation. So really, the affordances of the system became the choreographic score, um, which is a really interesting way of thinking of UI design as a choreographic score, or um, yeah, um, or the opposite. You can flip that too. So um, yeah, this became like a really um, interesting score within that. Um, yeah, confine. So Phoebe's going to talk more about the actual movement generation, what that, that's like. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how it's been performing it. Um, originally, in rehearsing, we, I came to realise how much the technology was controlling my movement and my performance. So the feeling, um, the feeling on my neck, it, it's, it's just like a tickling sensation, as Becky said. Um, it completely controls the quality of the movement and the origin of that movement. So everything was stemming from my shoulder and everything from the upper body. Um, it definitely, it definitely controls on the, the focus of the movement because I tended to neglect the lower part of my body because the sensor was, you know, only, only in the neck, and you know, overall the technology hacks the, um, the choreography and the my movement and performance, but the piece itself also hacks the actual performance, because, uh, for example, in the second section. Um, when Kate is triggering our sensors, she we have no idea as to when the trigger is going to go. So we don't know when the feeling on our neck is, is going to happen. So this anticipation and surprise kind of gives a complete new quality to the movement. Um, uh, yeah, and so overall, the, the performance has been really interesting to work and discover how this new, this new quality of kind of intrinsic and awkward quality of movement stemming from you know, inside my neck and the subtlety of the tickling. It's, it's been really interesting to discover. I, I've never really come across movement that, like that. Um, yeah, so we're, the, we're performing tonight at half eight, so you can come see more about that then. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. We'll be doing Q&A after the paper sessions, so keep your questions in mind for uh, yeah. another half hour. The next speaker is joining us via Skype, which is very carbon efficient, I would say. He is, uh, where is he, in uh, Sydney, Simon? Simon? Uh, Adelaide. Adelaide, yes. So that's also a time zone shift, which is a problem. <laughs> They're ahead of us, actually. Mm. 
So Simon Biggs' paper is Dark Matter, Co-Reading as a Generative Ontology. And we'll find out what that means in a minute. Simon can see you. Hello, Simon. So I had them here earlier. We can't hear you. Try again. No, no, it's, it's, it, should, it should work. That was your turn. <laughs> Hello, Simon. Yeah, why, why would you? Um, we, we can't hear you, Simon, so <laughs> one, <laughs> one moment. Um. Can you hear us? Can you give us a, a thumbs up? Okay, okay. so okay. my microphone is working. Um, Let's try now. Okay. No. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or I just um, take the audio off in sound, you know? If I could just say it. To HDMI, yeah. Okay, try now. Uh, testing, one, two, three. All right. Yeah, that's brilliant. Good. Okay, good. Uh, can, every, can, every, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Cool. <laughs> good, good. Um, some of the material I'm going to be showing will be um, quite liminal, quite dark and hard to see. So ideally, the theatre should be pretty dark for the presentation. Otherwise, you won't see the imagery, um, especially as uh, it's going over Skype. Um, my sound, my own voice on my headphones sound like it's breaking up. Is it, is it OK it's, at your end? It's really good. The sound is really it's good. It's really good. OK, fine. Then I won't worry about what I'm hearing. Um, so, I'm in Australia, which is why I can't be with you today. We're uh, rehearsing a piece, um, a different piece of performance work for uh, an interactive environment with dancers and live generative sound, um, which it's a different piece, so I've been deep in that, so I hope I don't talk about that instead of <laughs> what I'm meant to be talking about today, which is a newer piece. Um, what I will say is the composer on the piece we're doing here is uh, Garth Payne. I don't know if people know his work. Uh, he's an Australian-American-based composer working with live synthesis, granular synthesis, and, uh, yeah, interactive systems. Anyway, I'll go straight to the paper, um, and I'm going to uh, switch over to a PowerPoint, share my screen. That should be happening, okay. I go here. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Great. Right. Okay, so I'm talking about a work called Dark Matter, uh, which is, uh, and the paper is called that, and uh, subtitled Co Reading as a Generative Ontology. Um, Dark Matter is a fully immersive, physically interactive 3D video projection environment and uh, I've produced it this year and uh, as yet it's only been in my studio, it hasn't been uh, shown yet, but it's um, ready to go, so to speak. Um, the piece looks at whether the body might be perceived within the interactive interface 
uh, the live interface uh, as an absence, uh, something you can't see, but which you know is there from a physical, um, from the information that's around it, how, how you see this absence interacting with what isn't there. And in the case of this piece, it's the physical material of the installation and the information from what that's composed. As you'll see, the primary form of information in the piece is uh, words, short sentences. Um, you can see my screen, so you can see that I'm looking at it in terms of multi-agent interaction and the idea of, re of the interactors or the viewers uh, as active agents and I term them co-readers. Um, now dark, dark matter is a term used in physics uh, to uh, signify uh, the material that they believe the universe to exist of. I'll come back to that in a moment. But you could also consider it in terms of cultural material, not just physical material. What holds society together? That dark, if dark matter is the main thing that holds the universe together, then perhaps there's a cultural dark matter we're not aware of, that we don't know we know, to uh, paraphrase uh, Rob, some, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, that holds together our culture. Now, Donald Rumsfeld famously said um, at the time of the, uh, just prior to the Gulf War, war against Iraq, that um, in reference to weapons of mass destruction, which were never found, of course, that there were what he called the known knowns, the um, known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, which is basically a, tele, a teleology. Uh, he's, he thought of it as degrees of not knowing something, degrees of risk. But what he should have done was actually thought about the fourth element in that and recognize that it isn't a linear teleology, but a, bully, a more like a Boolean matrix of possibilities. And Slavo Zizek picked up on and pointed out that there was a fourth term in this Boolean algebra, which is the unknown knowns, the things that we don't know that we know. And Zizek equated this to the Freudian unconscious, um, which basically suggests that the unknown knowns, the cultural material, is the, what we choose to suppress or repress. And uh, sticking to the theme of uh, the war in Iraq and what happened in Abu Ghraib, uh, I think we've seen that construction of the unknown knowns uh, in practice, what we've chosen to forget. So as I said, dark matter is a term used in physics. Um, it's postulated that 95% of the matter of the universe is dark. It consists of both matter and uh, gravitational effect. And uh, it's this which holds the universe together. Um, so I'm suggesting that perhaps our culture is held together the same way. And that's what this installation seeks to engage. Uh, through treating the body, the the human interactor's body and bodies, because it's a multi-agent piece, uh, as uh, the primary agents through which that darkness is um, manifest, which is more or less, more or less what I've said here. Um, if you're familiar with assemblage theory, that is a sort of useful hook to use to um, consider where the work's coming from. Um, the work is proposing the, the construction of self within this model of cultural dark matter as a generative ontology that we construct ourselves, we construct our society 
largely of this unknown material. Um, and so I choose to explore that in a very liminal way in terms of the way the, the work is visualized and the way you interact with it. It's very, very on the borders of perception and legibility. The piece employs uh, real-time uh, motion tracking of the human body using a, a Microsoft Connect. The interactor's body is co-located within a computer-generated 3D space. The space is full of objects, but they are initially invisible. You can't see them. Um, the 3D space is uh, calculated using a physics engine, so there's a collision detection going on and all that kind of thing. There's no gravity. It's a gravity-free environment, so everything just floats around. Um, I did find that when uh, objects ricocheted off people's bodies, they had a habit of just disappearing into infinite space and never coming back. So I created an inverse force in the physics engine, which created a sort of breathing-like quality. So at regular intervals to about 20 seconds, the piece in, inverts its force. The, each object has an inverse force supplied to it that uh, causes it to change its direction. And this cr creates a situation where the world around you seems to collapse back towards you. But of course then you're interacting with it, so then it's expanding, attracting all the time. So it feels like it's breathing, and that sort of evokes this idea of dark energy, because there's no sense of where that's coming from. This is what the piece looks like. There's nobody in it. This is the uh, default, default state. Uh, here it's with two screens. And you can see two connects in uh, profile against the projections. And uh, so it can work all around. It's immersive, this thing. So as you approach the work, the imagery changes. The, you see more and more vectors, and the vectors start to move around. And uh, objects become visible as you move towards the screen. And the reason they become visible is because the only source of light in space comes from the interactor's virtual body. There's a white light on their head and uh, red and white, or red and blue lights, one on each hand. So by pointing or stretching out, you can illuminate the world and find your way through it. Here is uh, an image of the work with one interactor. You can see that they've illuminated the sentences. And uh, on one screen, that's much brighter because they're much closer to it. The other screen, they're further away, so it's much darker. Uh, I'll be showing a screen recording of this shortly, so that'll give you a, a better idea. I've got very little time, so I'll carry on quickly. There's a screenshot of um, what you see. Um, the imagery is made up of a large number of text fragments and these have been taken from an interview with a person called uh, Fardi al who was a prisoner at Guantanamo Bay, uh, interviewed by Tom Wilner. And uh, I've cut it up using a technique familiar from uh, somebody like, uh, uh, well, just cut up technique. And um, the texts are physically interactive with you, the viewer, but also with each other. And I'm using a, what's called an interpretive grammar engine. So the texts read each other and then rewrite each other. So they evolve over time into new texts. Um, when, a th when a second interactor enters, the work changes state again. Uh, when there's only one viewer, the camera, which dictates what you see on the screen, which dictates what's rendered, and the point of view, is in a default position outside 3D space. But 
as soon as a third person comes in, or a second person, but a, th a third person viewer, uh, the camera then locates to the head of the first person and looks to the head of the second person. So the point of view then becomes a function of the two interactors' uh, positions, positions of their points of, of their heads. So you can see here, suddenly they're immersed into the uh, environment and uh, rather than being outside of it. And that's a screenshot. Now I'm wanting to, wanting to play the video, so I'll skip the, the discussion about first person, second person and third person reading. That's all in the paper, the full paper, and also the chunk on co-reading and uh, co-writing. And I'll go straight to the uh, video. Uh, it's a three-minute video. So it starts, I don't I hope you can see this, it starts off with very liminal material with just these flashing lines. This is the default view before anybody walks in. I'll just go forward a bit. Here you can see it's about to breathe, I think. And now somebody's walked in. And you can see how all the texts are scattering as they walk through them. You can't see the person, obviously, because they're not represented. This is a screen recording. It's not a recording of the studio. As the... The person's now on the left-hand side of the screen. They're moving across to the right-hand side of the screen. You can see the text, so Rick James Brown. They're pretty hard to read in this mode, but as you get closer to the screen, they get bigger and you illuminate more screens. You can see the breathing there. You can see the text are all sort of moving towards the center of the world but the interactors moving through them and knocking them around again. And now a second viewer has come in. So the camera is on the head of the first viewer, looking to the head of the second viewer. So the point of view is a, a long vector from one viewer's head to the other viewer's head. And this is where the idea of co-reading becomes physically alive uh, and basically it's a in terms of the theme of your conference uh, it becomes a sort of live interface you, you can only really experience the content of the work by navigating it together the two viewers have to um, not choreograph but they have to coordinate their movements to be able to read and uh, move around. They can navigate the space. They can't really move that much. They can move around the space because they're co-located with the texts in the 3D environment. But the main thing they can control is the, the point of view, which when you're in the space, when it's in this mode, very, very immersive. Now I'm aware I'm running out of time. So, at a certain point, the second viewer will leave the room and it should revert back to the single viewer point of view. There it is. And, uh, and then if they, when they leave the room, it goes back to the default point of view. So, there's a little bit I'll hear about Deleuze, which again you can read in the paper. Um, mainly about applying this idea of assemblage theory to how we construct our understanding of things and not just our understanding of things even, but our perception and how that it can be a function of uh, the, the repressed the dark, as dark matter. Um, yeah, but I've run out of time now, so that's basically technical data for the work and 
I can take questions, so I'll go back to the video. So I'm happy to take some questions. Simon, we're yep. going we're gonna to take the questions after the session. So yep. if, um, do you mind if I call you in 20 minutes and you join yep. the panel for questions? Yeah, that's, abs that's absolutely fine. Okay. Uh, did everyone, was everyone able to see the video? And, yeah, yeah, um, it was very clear. I think we should okay. give Simon a, a, an applause now, if possible. <laughs> There you go, Simon, a little taste of the audience. So, um, see you in 20 it's minutes. Always nice. All right. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. See you. So, um, Chris, are you going to bring. Okay, so our next speaker is Enrique Hurtado, and he's going to be talking about interfacing the Chalaparta, digitalizing a traditional instrument with the help of its players. And I think some of you might have been to his workshop. So, Enrique, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Enrique Hurtado, um, I have done, last year I finished my PhD on the University of the Basque Country, and this I'm going to show you is a, a part of uh, my PhD research, which is uh, basically a, a research on this um, instrument uh, called Chalaparta. At this point, some of you might think, Chala what? Uh, is Chalaparta, and some of you might have seen it yesterday. We were playing it near the, at lunchtime. So just to describe very quickly, it's just a, a percussion tradition, which is original from the rural areas of the Basque Country. And it's, uh, the instrument is a variable set of uh, wooden planks, which are placed uh, horizontally, uh, and they are beat uh, vertically with uh, wooden buttons. And the way of playing it is uh, by at least two uh, players interlocking the beats in alternance, and this is uh, quite uh, unique. There are not so many uh, uh, traditions which use this, this type of uh, alternance. So this is how it looks like. This is an old, old one, um, and I'm gonna show you a video in a second. This is, uh, um, this is the, some of the old players. It's around 1984, and they were like 80 years old at the time. Um, so nowadays it changed a little bit, and this is a typical uh, chalaparta. It consists of a different, I mean, any kind of, uh, any number of wooden planks, different size can, can be can use uh, any type of wood, and you can even use the different types of materials, like uh, nowadays people use uh, iron, uh, stone or even plastics or anything. Um, and they are pretty much like this. There's no standard way of building them. It's just a bunch of uh, planks that you beat with those kind of uh, buttons. Um, it's uh, quite interesting because we don't know anything about it, really. Uh, there's no references until the early 20s, almost. There's one reference at the late 90s. And uh, around the 60s, uh, there were only six people playing it, so three couples only. 
by 1963, there were only two couples left, and they were these old guys in the farms, and people didn't even know the, that this was there. In people living near the farms, they didn't even know this tradition. It was totally kind of gone. Um, some people claim that there were more people playing it, but uh, publicly, there's only uh, references to, to these uh, two couples around the late, uh, early 60s. So uh, at this point, similar than in, uh, around the world, I guess, there was this uh, very um, huge uh, cultural movement in the Basque Country, uh, which uh, it was quite interesting in the Basque Country because it had a strong link with uh, contemporary art. So it was artists that they were uh, triggering this movement. So the people who took, uh, who learned playing Chalaparta and recovered the, the practice were um, people coming from art and, and poetry, uh, especially the Arce brothers. And uh, that, this gave the, the, the Chalaparta a very kind of avant-garde or experimental uh, angle, which led to this um, very interesting situation in 1972 where in the encounters of Pamplona, which was a huge event where hundreds of uh, musicians and artists from all over the world, they met uh, John Cage and Steve Reich. They attended a performance by the Arce brothers and they were really interested. And especially Steve Reich, he became totally obsessed with uh, uh, Chalaparta. Probably because of some of the characteristics of the Chalaparta, they are not so far from those explored in, in contemporary music. Like, uh, there hasn't been any tuning uh, of the planks until really recently, around year 2000. Um, the pulse, the traditional rhythm, is really irregular and very fluctuating. It's really very strange the way they played. And it, this was more or less like this until the 90s, uh, when they started changing the rhythm to make it more regular, to be able to play other instruments with it. And then there's this idea of um, um, improvisation, uh, collective improvisation. So it's always two people at least, and they have to follow certain rules, but they are not really, um, uh, uh, I mean, the rules are not really written. And they often talk about it as a game, so they, they feel they are playing one each other. So this uh, Euba is a, a researcher. He, he's doing a PhD now on, on Chalaparta, and he talks about this idea of this xylophonization, which means that the traditional percussive instrument is turning into something melodic because of the changes on the tuning and, and the changes on the, on the rhythm. And then finally, this is really in interesting idea. Nowadays, when we talk about Chalaparta, we think of, uh, most people think of the object, you know, the planks. But if you talk to people who are 70s and the old players as well, the, the ones that are dead, they talk about uh, Chalaparta being the rhythm. So actually, you could play uh, with some glasses on a, on a table. As long as the rhythm is uh, it's, uh, Chalaparta, it is Chalaparta, and uh, not necessarily just the object. But nowadays, more people, they, it has shifted a little bit. But this interesting thing, you know, this idea that a, um, the rhythm is actually the, the, the thing, not the instrument. So uh, these are the, the Arce brothers, the, the ones that took over the Chalaparta in the, uh, the mid-60s. How do I put this full screen? This is very short, but uh, they just took over what the old guys were doing and they just pushed it to the kind of limit and they play around with the flexibility of uh, timing and there's a lot of uh, things on, on silence and how, you know, this idea of uh, going late or early. Um, uh, wait. So, uh, about academic research on Chalaparta, uh, I think I would just point out that there is this um, PhD in English, because most of the um, literature about Chalaparta is either in Spanish or Basque. 
Uh, this is a PhD by Escribano. It's in English, so it's probably mm, the first place to, to start with. There, are so, there is also some uh, article by Left in English, and then um, a paper recently published by Magnus and myself on the Tenor Conference. And there's also a French book by Beltran. Beltran is one of the players who were also recovering in the 60s, and he has been um, writing a lot about Chalaparta, and there's a documentary and a few books on it. There's a, he has a, a kind of a museum on traditional instruments of the Basque Country, and he has a lot of uh, uh, material about Chalaparta. But there hasn't been so much done from the academia. Now, currently, there are three PhDs. I finished my PhD last year, and then there's two more PhDs coming out on different aspects on Chalaparta at the moment. Uh, about software, there has been some attempts to do software, but basically, mainly they have been either uh, toys for touch screens or sequencers. And then there was this uh, Techno Chalaparta, which is quite interesting, but uh, it was done in the 90s, and the technology at the time didn't really allow for um, really much, much uh, things. So it was not, it's not so much about improvisation, and it's, there's no generative process uh, going on. So basically, what we did is, is um, uh, trying to develop software based on the rhythm. The idea that the rhythm is the Chalaparta is uh, quite handy here, because you can take the idea of, uh, OK, the instrument is not the Chalaparta. I take the rhythm, and then I can use it in a computer, because it's a kind of algorithm. So is it possible to recreate something of that in the computer? And what happens when we do that? So we ended up with two different software. First one is this Auto Chalaparta, which is uh, software that generates automatically both uh, players somehow. So it makes like a fully both sides of the play, of the play using weighted random process uh, ch decisions. And there is this uh, um, graphical user interface that allows you to tune different parameters on how those uh, uh, the process, the underlying process is, is happening. And the second one is this interactive Chalaparta. It's a kind of reaction against the first one, uh, because uh, play, uh, players who use the, the auto chalaparta, you can use the auto chalaparta to play on its own, but you can also mute one of the players. So you just get one, a single player. It makes the rhythm of a single player. And you can follow with a real chalaparta. But then, of course, there's no connection at all. It's not listening to you. So uh, they thought it was really interesting, but also a bit frustrating. So a reaction of that is this uh, interactive. Chalaparta, which is using a microphone to listen to a single player, and he plays back. So effectively, you are playing Chalaparta, human and computer. Yeah, so it listens and analyzes the play you're doing, and it reacts as well as learning. Uh, so it allows for improvisation, and it uses Markov, Markov, changes, uh, Markov changes and weighted random choices to, to do it. Um, so. Now I have a, this little video of a viva of my PhD where this player, he was, uh, he's uh, Banyati Turrioch, he's a very, um, he's been playing many years, and he was involved in the, with me in the development, so he's playing with the software. <laughs> development was very much um, um, done in close connection with those players. Uh, so we, because, uh, um, yeah, I wanted to have a feedback from them from very early on in the process of development. Um, and we look, I look for very experienced uh, players, but with an open minded, because I was a bit afraid that they would be very traditionally oriented. Um, and the, the, I wanted to get uh, to know the latest trends on Chalaparta because myself, I learned playing Chalaparta when I was around 16 years old. And then for around 20 years almost, I didn't really have any connection to Chalaparta. And when I came back, I found that uh, it has changed quite a lot. Um, so I, I wanted to know uh, what's going on there. And also, I wanted to have feedback, feedback on the software as I was work, uh, developing it. So we scheduled uh, meetings on the uh, development process and like every you know, some kind of landmarks and those were very laid back um, very relaxed uh, meetings where <clears throat> we'd go and um, 
show them some, some functionality we had developed and they would just use it, and test it, and then just uh, talk out loud, you know, as, as soon as the, anything that they thought about it. Uh, I, I was very interested on the subjective, uh, subjective experience of the players using the, the software. Um, so this is uh, one of them, is Benyat, and he's, uh, he's been playing a lot, Chalaparta. I think he's been playing so much that he really enjoyed playing with a machine because he needed uh, something else. You know, after many years playing non-stop Chalaparta, uh, he was a bit of, uh, yeah, he needed something new. So it was quite, uh, he, he was very, very much involved with me and it was very interesting. This is uh, Euba, Aguirre Euba, the one I mentioned before. He's an academic, he's doing a PhD now in Chalaparta, and he's percussionist. Uh, so he had a very academic point of view on, on this and it was very, very interesting to have him um, using the software. And this last one, uh, Yvonne, he's a musician and he's very much into uh, improvisation and contemporary music. So he had a totally different angle and it was the three of them, they actually gave very complementary points of view. Um, so this feedback, uh, it had two different sides. There's like the software side and then there's the Chalaparta side somehow. On the software side, uh, obviously we fixed uh, many bugs because of uh, them using the software. And the key idea I think is that we would never produce this software without this feedback. We would have produced something else. Um, most likely less interesting for the actual players. Um, the feedback on, on the software about Chal Auto Chalaparta, they said it was too unpredictable, it's too random, so they found very, the system was too random, even though they thought this was really interesting because it's absolutely opposite to what happens when you play with somebody, you try to communicate with the other person. And the software is not trying to communicate, so they thought it was really interesting. And I will mention this a bit later. So this uh, impredictability of the uh, auto chalaparta led to this interactive chalaparta. And again, this was a bit the opposite. They found this was a bit too flat because it doesn't produce any ideas. It just um, um, follows you blindly somehow. And also the, the scope of uh, the wide of uh, the range of styles that it, it uh, understands uh, is a bit um, limited. So you have to play in a certain way to, for it to understand. And on the Chalaparta side, uh, you have this idea that because of them playing with the machine, it, has, it was so alien that it made them very self-aware of, of what, what is to play Chalaparta somehow. So it, it took a uh, lot of questions. Uh, uh, I mean, we realized that Chalaparta, they didn't uh, think too much about what do I do when I play. And by playing with the machine, they were really very self-aware of that. So what happens when they are playing? Is there any rules? What are the rules? Also this idea of the body perception that the, when they play, they didn't realize that they actually look each other, even though they are not uh, directly looking, just like peripherically seeing the body. Uh, they get a lot of information about the movement of the body and the arms. So they predict uh, what they are going to do, the, the other is going to do. And because of playing with the machine, this was gone and it was really confusing. So we had to develop some tools to actually visualize the rhythm that the a computer is producing. And also, the, I think w something which is very interesting is that the players themselves, they change the understanding of Chalaparta by using this, this software. This is one of the tools to uh, visualize the, um, the rhythm. So it's a kind of circular timeline, and then the beats uh, are mm, drawn. Uh, this is time, time goes up here, and then the size is the amplitude. And this other one is a more conventional timeline where the, this every uh, vertic uh, horizontal line is uh, one plank. So this is a three plank chalaparta. And each of the uh, colors is a player. So this is player one and this is player two. But in this case, this is a human and this is the machine. And uh, the size of the vertical line is the amplitude. So, um, um, I think the contact with the players was really crucial to the development because uh, we would have never have produced this. It would have been something else. Um, it influenced uh, the understanding of Chalaparta. And I was presenting very early uh, versions of this software in a conference in 2015 in, in Pamplona, a conference on Chalaparta. They were all Chalaparta players there. Um, they were really, really interested because suddenly they, uh, it made them see themselves from outside somehow. The idea of playing with a machine was for them so weird that uh, it really triggered a lot of questions. 
So we will have to produce now a better software that is a bit more creative and probably understands more uh, Chalaparta styles. And I'm very appealing, uh, I think very interesting the idea is to catalog uh, Chalaparta styles because they are, it's very kind of um, dialect, they are dialects of uh, playing. So by using this software, we would be able to study further the way they interact with each other, which I think is very special in Chalaparta because of the alternation. And it would be very nice to be able to distribute the software. Uh, and this is the next plan I have, is to be able to package the software so that mm, uh, all of them, they can use it in their computers. And then I get more, um, yeah, more feedback, both uh, qualitative and quantitative. So if you want to know more about this, uh, there is this URL where you can see this, uh, my PhD dissertation. It's in Spanish, sorry. And there's a video of the, of the um, demonstration, and tomorrow I'll be demoing it in the demo session. So if you have some question or you want to see it, how it works, or some technical question, then I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, while we get the Skype connection back, um, I know there's some microphones for the room, so this gentleman will come to you. Uh, we also have some microphones for the speakers. They've disappeared. Okay. Welcome back. We're here with the panel on stage, and you're there behind them. And can we hear you? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Okay. So that was a very interesting three papers, and what I found most interesting, just to be subjective here at this point, is the dialogue between the players. So in the case of the dancers, the mediated dialogue through them through the system. Uh, in case of the dark matter, it would be actually also a dialogue between the system and one user or the system and two users. So it's this kind of different types of agency. And of course, with the traditional instrument, with the new instrument, um, this kind of self-perception that changes that, to me, was the really interesting part. Um, so yes, are there any questions from the audience? Hold on. Thanks. Um, I, I have a question for Enrique. Actually, it was thank you. It was it was really um, really exciting, and I found interesting the way that you talked about uh, contemporary players reference the object, whereas more traditional players reference the rhythm rather than the object. And at the same time, uh, in the new developments, you're um, looking more at the at the software than at the interface. And I'm wondering whether you're looking also in some ways at how you might, it, it seems to me that you could be leveraging this open approach to rhythmic process rather than object um, in some really interesting ways for interface development. I don't know if it's a coherent question. So. Um, is it working? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, the um, thing is that <clears throat> Um, this is kind of gone, so if you talk to young people, they don't think about this at all. They, when they say Chalaparta is the object. But as soon as you start to, to, to listen and, and read what they were saying, the, the old, well, old people, you know, the, the ones that picked up in the 60s, it is, they are really, really radical about this. They, they say, no, the, it's not the object at all. And they have a lot of um, stories about how they were in some um, party and then they wanted to play Chalaparta so they break apart some, some uh, pieces of wood from somewhere and then they play or some barrels of plastic or whatever. So it's very, very much something that is being forgotten. Um, but um, my point in, in the research I think is that um, the, uh, the new generation or people my age, they don't know so much about this uh, recovery in the 60s and how it was and it's actually really, really interesting from many points of views and this is one of them. So I, I wanted to, to focus on that, you know, the idea that the rhythm is um, 
is a, um, a because it's a kind of algorithm somehow. No, it's the idea of how you make the rhythm rather than the object itself. Did I answer? Okay. Any other questions? So in that case, I have a question uh, for all of you, actually, to uh, tell me a bit about how you see the relationship between the human and the machine, because I think that's underlying theme of the conference, and it's also, I think, the central issue we all deal with in our field. So if any one of you has something very concrete to say. I'm, I'm having a hard, <laughs> I'm having a hard time understanding the microphone because it's a uh, way it's amplified in the auditorium. I could try. I can't really hear, so I didn't understand the question. I think Sean was, uh, uh, Jean was asking um, the relationship between the machine and the human in in arts and the, and the role of the interface. If you had any, what was it, comments mm. on that? Or? Yeah. Mm. Well, I think in my own work and my own practice and in the piece I talked about today, uh, that's the sort of the key concern. Um, I would see the relationship as one of um, mutual codependency, uh, a sort of mutual coming into being. Catherine Hales, the American uh, media theorist, is... Um, propose that people and machines uh, are the outcome of and are a continuing process of co-evolution. That people have evolved machines and now machines are evolving people at the same time. So it's a recursive process where you can no longer say which came first, the chicken or the egg. And uh, in, a, in a sort of framework like that, you have to start thinking about human ontology, human, um, the nature of human being, uh, as hybridized and extended into our technologies. And by that I mean not just um, computers or aeroplanes or cars, but, but also things like language and social structures and uh, social uh, norms, more mores. So you could you could look at it in a sort of Foucauldian way, sort of uh, how we as individuals and as a collective that encompasses both people and our technologies function as a, a sort of panoptic structure where we uh, regulate ourselves accordingly. And that, I guess that was sort of the key idea behind a piece like Dark Matter, this idea of um, cultural dark matter, of uh, the repression of things and how that repression then leads to uh, a kind of social control. So, we are controlled by those things we choose to not know. So technology is an extension of our civilization in a way and the cultural achievement as well? Well, an extension of our civilization, but also our civilization is an extension of our technology. It's a recursive thing, a mutual okay. yeah. recursive. Yeah. Thanks. So, Kate, you had something to add. Yeah, um, actually, I am looking at this completely differently. <laughs> I think, um, particularly in dance works, this idea of technology as an extension has been like way overdone and hasn't really yielded anything interesting in terms of actual movement. And I think that we need to stop um, say, like, reflecting what the dancer is doing in the technology. Like, I wave my arm and there's an image. Um, I'm really bored with that. So I was looking at technology as a disruption, and um, that's sort of what the machine is trying to do in my work, um, is actually somehow um, change what the human's doing, um, even if it's subtle, even if it's something as subtle as a tickle. <laughs> it's still somehow changing um, what the performer is doing. And I'm much more interested in, in work that does that these days. I, I would just add, I think my interest is often more technology as what it is, prosthesis, and part of the part of 
I, I guess it extends on some level to what Simon said, an extension, but in a, I, I think of it in a different way, like our, our glasses or, you know, our other, you know, pens or whatever other technology you use, it's just another part of that. But also in some ways, I mean, I think a lot of the things that Kate and I have talked about in other um, projects is this idea of technology as a collaborator. Um, so, I'm, I mean, there's some, there's dark side of, that we talk about a lot in our work around the way technology is used in terms of collecting data or other, other ways that it's used, but that it's, it's a collaborator in the, in the work that we do. It's, it's a prosthesis, it's, it's, but I, I, I quite like the way Kate likes to disrupt it, so we work really well together on that, on that level. <laughs> Thanks. Any comments on that? And I think the, the ethical question here, in, in also what you stated is really interesting, that the data collection, the kind of commodification of personal data, um, also the quantification of the human body, so that our everyday becomes quantified. I think, and in dance, I mean, it's a, it's a particularly poignant discipline, because you're, I think the central thing of dance, like you just said, is not actually outside of the body, it's inside of the body. I mean, that's how I perceive it. And as a musician, I have a different relationship because my instrument is outside of myself. So I think we have these kind of, um, there's a tension, an inherent tension with the tools. And I, in that sense, yeah, technology, language, um, concepts are tools, basically. Yeah, so. Okay, any comments from, from the audience? I think everybody's in awe of your presentation. <laughs> Or asleep. There's coffee, actually. There's coffee. So I'd like to give a big hand, big round of applause for our speakers. And thanks, Simon, for being with us from Adelaide. What time is it your, your side? Where uh, time for dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so good night. Yeah, good night to you too. Hmm. Hope it's a great conference and everything's great in Brighton. Brilliant. See you later. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there's coffee now and the next thing is 11.30. You have it in your programs. Thanks. <laughs>